Okay, welcome to part five of our chapter five videos where we're going to continue our discussion about uh, stereochemistry of organic molecules. And we talked about the stereochemistry of organic molecules, we introduced the concept of chirality, chiral objects. We said for organic molecule needs a stereogenic center, four different substituents for an sp3 hybridized carbon. We want to continue this discussion a little bit and look at a bit more in a particular uh, property of chiral objects, chiral molecules called optical activity. And so we introduced, of course, the concept of non-superimposable mirror images, chiral objects, chiral molecules can exist as enantiomers. In this case, when they've got four different substituents around an sp3 carbon, so we looked at the example of R and S2 bromobutane, non-superimposable mirror images. And when we introduced these molecules, we said, look, they've got the same physical and chemical characteristics. The enantiomers are identical with respect to each other in terms of boiling point, melting point, index of refraction, same polarity. And so that means that you can't separate these or distinguish the enantiomers based on melting point. You can't separate them by distillation. You can't even separate them by chromatography. Their properties are all identical. However, there is one physical property that is different between the two different enantiomers. The only physical or chemical difference is the direction which each of the enantiomers rotates plain polarized light. One enantiomer will rotate in one direction, the other enantiomer will rotate it in an equal and opposite amount in the other direction. So we'll explain a little bit what this is and how we make use of this particular property. So what is plane polarized light? Well, again, if we remember back in the first year, we talk about electromagnetic radiation, so light in general, and there's two vectors that we look at, the magnetic field and an electric field, and these are all propagating in all directions as a beam of light comes towards us. And so now, for example, if we were looking at the end of that beam, you'd see sort of an infinite array of arrows. Here we've got just a few of those drawn in, but you'd see an infinite array of arrows in all directions for all of these vectors as they propagate, as that beam of light propagates towards you. Now, what we can do is put a filter in that line of, in that beam of light that filters out or polarizes the light only into one specific plane. And so this is what we're describing here with this polarizing filter. We've, we've filtered out all of the other magnetic and electronic vectors so that all we've got is a single vector that exists in one plane as we're showing here. So if you looked at the end of that beam of light, you see it just in a single plane. And so what we can do is we can measure that. We put another second polarizing filter in the other end and you'd be able to see everything. If the second polarizing filter is oriented in the same direction as the first one, you'd be able to see that light propagating through. Now, if that other polarizing filter was oriented 90 degrees to the first filter, it would block all of that light coming through. You wouldn't be able to see anything at all. And in fact, we use this property of polarizing filters in making sunglasses. If you've got a pair of sunglasses that say polarized on them, they've got these kind of filters in them and kind of filters off some of the light as it's reflected off surfaces like a highway. So how does this apply to what we want to use it for organic molecules? Well, as we said, organic molecules can rotate the direction of plane polarized light in one of two opposite directions. And so we can measure this effect. If we put our chiral mo molecule, one of our chiral molecules in this tube in the center, this is kind of the rough schematic of the design of one of the instruments that we use to measure this. We've got a light source, we've got a polarizing filter that polarizes that light into a single plane. And now we've got a tube containing a solution of our molecule. And as that beam of light passes through that solution of one of our enantiomers, that polarized light gets rotated slightly in one of two directions, either to the right or a positive direction or to the left, a negative direction. And we can measure that just by twisting that second polarizing filter a little bit to see how many degrees of rotation have been imparted on that plane polarized light as it passes through that molecule. And so we can calculate this. And this is just a brief uh, sort of summary of what we get here. We get this something called a specific rotation where we can measure the observed rotation in degrees. How far do we have to rotate that second polarizing filter? How many degrees? The concentration of our solution, how long is that tube, the temperature, and we use something called the sodium D line, so a specific wavelength of light. So we get something that's called a specific rotation, or you might even hear it called an alpha D value in some cases. You might just hear me say that very quickly sometime. So this is something that we can measure. Of course, we're not going to ask you to calculate this in organic one, but just to let you know where we get these values from. And so what you observe, if you have, for example, for R and S2 bromobutane, if you had a jar that contained only R2 bromobutane, and you put that in that polarizing filter, what you'd observe is a specific rotation of minus 23.1. 
And if you had a jar that contained only the S enantiomer of 2-bromobutane and you put that jar, that tube of that in that polarizing filter, you'd observe that you'd have to rotate that polarizing filter an equal and opposite amount in the positive direction. Okay, so now some of the questions you might have is, wait a minute, why does plain polarized light rotate one of two directions when it passes through a chiral molecule? For that, you'll have to go find a physics professor and bug them a little bit about that's the kind of thing that they're really interested in. Just for us, for us as organic chemists, the reasons behind it doesn't matter at all. It's just the fact that this is something observable. We can take a molecule, we can put it in these polarizing filters, and if it rotates light, it's what we call optically active. That must mean it is, by definition, a chiral object because it has this influence on plain polarized light. And in fact, that's how many of these chiral molecules were discovered, was by their influence on plain polarized light and the fact they could rotate them one of two possible directions. So this is something measurable, something that we can use as organic chemists, and we'll talk a little bit about it right at the end of this video. Okay, so now the next question we might be thinking about is, well, what would you observe in that polarimeter if you had an equal molar mixture of both enantiomers? You've got one enantiomer that's rotating light to the left and another enantiomer that's rotating light an equal and opposite amount to the right. If you had exactly equal amounts of both enantiomers in that, in that polarimeter, what might you expect to observe? Well, the answer is, of course, an observed optical rotation of zero. You wouldn't have to rotate that second polarizing filter in any direction at all because there would be no influence on the light. So now this is a special circumstance that we'd like to, like to describe here. This is what we call a racemic mixture. It's an equal molar mixture of enantiomers. I should say achiral objects, achiral molecules, don't rotate plane polarized light at all. We don't observe that in, in an achiral molecule. So if you put an achiral molecule on a polarimeter, you don't observe any rotation. This circumstance is different than an achiral molecule. It's a chiral molecule, but an equimolar mixture. We call it a racemic mixture. That's different to distinguish that from an achiral object. Now, the other part of this as well, too, is we have to have a way of representing this. In a drawing, we can draw both enantiomers and equal mixture of it, but that's a real headache. So we've got a very scientific term that we use to describe the thing that we use to indicate this on a chemical structure. We call it a squiggly line. So there's another way that we have of indicating that we've got an equimolar mixture of both enantiomers. We use this squiggly line when we draw the bond in, just kind of to hint that we've got an equimolar mixture of both of these molecules present, both of these enantiomers. And I know you're saying, hey, why are you making such a big deal out of what seems like a little piece of chemical trivia? We're going to use this representation, this squiggly line representation, a lot when we get to Chapter 7 material, when we start looking at substitutions and even eliminations. And we'll be able to use this representation because we'll be interested in the stereochemical outcome of some of our reactions. So we'll have to use this way to represent what's going on in those, in those reactions. And so this is something we'll introduce here because it's got a very specific meaning, but it's something that we'll use quite a bit when we get to those sections in Chapter 7. Now, what about those circumstances where we might have a different ratio of enantiomers? What if we've got an unequal mixture of enantiomers? What would we expect to observe in the rotation if we do that? So, for example, if we've got, uh, if we've got an unequal mixture, if we've got lots more of the S2-bromobutane than we do of the R2-bromobutane, what would we expect to observe? Well, we would expect to observe the amount of the R2-bromobutane that's present to cancel out at least some of the rotation of the S2-bromobutane, but if there's more of the S than the R, that remaining excess of that S enantiomer would have an influence on the rotation that we observe. Right, so we would observe, for example, a rotation of some amount, not the full amount of plus 23, but some smaller amount of that in the positive direction. That would be an indication to us that we've got more of the S, or an excess of the S enantiomer, over the R enantiomer. And in fact, this is the term that we use to describe this, called an enantiomeric excess. Now, we most typically observe this circumstance if we're doing some kind of synthetic reaction, maybe where we've got an influence on that stereogenic center, and we might have more of one of the two possible enantiomers than the other. And we'll see maybe some examples of this in Chapter 7. We'll see quite a few more examples of this kind of thing in organic, too, if you stick around for that one. So what can, can we make use of this information? Well, we can if you know the rotation of the pure enantiomer. In this case, we know the rotation of the pure enantiomer. You know S2-bromobutane rotates plane polarized light plus 23. If we know the observed rotation, we can use this to calculate something that we call the percent enantiomeric excess, or percent EE. 
And this is an indication of how many, of what percentage of uh, that excess enantiomer is present. And so here in this particular case, we can observe, take that observed rotation plus 13. We know the full rotation would be plus 23. We get a ratio out of that times 100, means we've got a 57% enantiomeric excess of the S enantiomer in this case, because we know the S enantiomer is the one with the positive rotation. And we take the absolute values of those observed rotation versus the rotation of the pure enantiomer. So we can express this as a percent EE, and it often is very uh, useful indication of things like the outcome of our reactions. So it's, a, it's an observed thing we can get and gives a very usable measure that we take some of. So we just want to make you aware of that. Okay, now the other thing, the other point I want to make here is that uh, you might be asking yourself, okay, well, look, if we know what the rotation of a molecule is, can we link that back to the so-called absolute configuration, that Conningle prelog configuration, that R versus S? If I know S, if I know the S, can I get measure, know which rotation it is? And if I know R, can I, or if I know the rotation, can I know which configuration it is? And the answer is no, there's no connection at all between R and S and optical rotation. The optical rotation, the plus and minus, the direction that those molecules rotate, plane polarized light, that's a measurable, observable thing on the molecule itself. You have to do an experiment to determine that. R and S is just something that we've invented as chemists, so we can tell each other which one of the two enantiomers that we're drawing on a piece of paper. There's no connection. If you know one, you know absolutely nothing about the other at all. And so here's an example. Here's two molecules where the S enantiomer gives you the minus rotation and the R enantiomer gives you the plus rotation. And here's two other nearly identical molecules, again with the stereogenic center. In this case, the S enantiomer gives you the plus rotation, and the R enantiomer gives you the minus rotation. There are no connections between the two of these. One is a measurable, observable, physical trait of the molecule, and the other is just something that we've invented as chemists to be able to tell us what's going on. So no connection between R and S and optical rotation, but we can use that optical rotation, first of all, to determine if a molecule that we're looking at might have a stereogenic center, might be a chiral molecule, and then can also measure things like enantiomeric excess to be able to get some idea about what amount of that excess enantiomer is present. And so we'll leave that at this, this uh, video on this topic here. That's what we want to cover there. And we'll kind of finish off chapter five material with a couple more videos.